Hello, my name is Emily Taylor and Michael has asked me here to talk to you today about game design. I've been in the industry for about six years. I have been a game designer, an associate producer, and I'm currently a producer. And the two main titles that I've worked on are EverQuest 2 and most recently Defiance, which was launched last month. Back when I was in high school, the idea of computer classes was brand new. We had Commodore 64s and Apple IIe's in the classroom. And although I enjoyed playing computer games back then, the industry as we know it now didn't really exist. There wasn't even much of a game industry yet. So it didn't occur to me that making games for a living was a career choice that even existed. So I studied biology. I got my bachelor's degree at the University of Toronto in plant pathology. And then I did a master's of science in molecular plant pathology at the University of East Anglia. And then, because there aren't a lot of jobs in pure sciences these days, unless you go all the way to a PhD in postdoctoral work, I got a job in IT support. I was an IT help desk administrator, a systems analyst, a database developer, an email administrator, and then an IT manager. And I got to work in England, in Brazil, and in Australia. In 2000, I encountered a game called EverQuest that was going to change my life forever. It was one of the first massively multiplayer online games there were thousands of players all around the world who could talk to you at any time of day or night. It was a game unlike any I'd ever played before. The social aspects fascinated me, and I played EverQuest pretty much nonstop for the next four years. When EverQuest 2, the sequel, came out, I switched to that. And I became what they call a player influencer or a player advocate. I was very active in the community. I posted on forums, I did volunteer work, I posted FAQs, I maintained bug lists, I maintained contact with the developers trying to get them to fix the bugs. I helped investigate problems with the distribution of the game in Australia, which was having some issues. I did everything that I could possibly do to help the game. I even attended one of their fan events, which they at that point called fanfares. And that was when I met a number of the EverQuest 2 developers. And I realized like a light dawning, hey, this is now a career option. This is something that people actually do for a living. This is something I could do for a living. And this became my new goal. I continued to be very helpful. I continued to learn everything I could about the game. And about a year after that, one of the developers that I had maintained contact with mentioned to me that they had a job opening for a trade skill designer and suggested that I should apply. So I did. And I interviewed with Scott Hartzman, who was then the producer of EverQuest 2. And I basically told him, I'm kind of already working for you. How about you start paying me? And fortunately for me, he agreed. And he imported me from Australia to San Diego. And I spent the next five years helping to make EverQuest 2 the awesome game that it is. And that is the short story of how I got my dream job working on games. So I'm here today to talk to you about how you can get your dream job. And if your dream job happens to be in games, this will be very applicable to you. But even if it isn't, I hope this is going to help you figure out how to approach getting your dream job, regardless of what it is. Of course, you may think that the hard part is getting your dream job. But what they don't tell you is the hardest part is often figuring out what your dream job is. Once you know that, you can at least make a plan and start working towards it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about games. Maybe games are your dream job, maybe not, but I'll try and describe the industry a little bit to you, talk about how a game gets made, what it's like working in the industry, and maybe that'll help you figure out whether or not this uh, job would be for you. Then I'll talk about getting into the industry. Uh, how do you get in? How do you break in? Um, how do you get qualified? And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the scary stuff, job applications, and how to apply for stuff, and how to interview. So how does a game get made? Well, this can vary a lot depending on the size of the game, the type of the game, and the experience of the team making it. And I assume that you've covered a bit of this in your class already. But at a very high level, there's three basic stages. Pre-production, which is before you really start actually creating stuff, which is when you sit down and you plan out what's the game going to be, what are people going to do. You're writing a lot of documents. You're probably scribbling on paper a lot, on whiteboards. There's not a lot of actual development happening at this time. This is all pre-planning. Then the production phase, which is where you take the designs that you made in pre-production and start turning them into something actually playable. This is where most of the work happens. There's a lot of iteration, a lot of testing and redoing and playtesting again. But eventually, if things go well, you launch the game. And then the third stage would be the live. Now, depending on the type of game, this could mean a number of different things. It may just mean a maintenance mode where there are a few bug fixes, but nothing major happens and the team may move on to other projects. It could mean planning for updates and expansions, particularly for MMOs. That's a pretty common model. And for any type of game, 
how well it does when it launches will obviously affect what happens after launch. Even if it is intended to be a one-off sale and the team would move on, if it's a fantastic success, maybe they'll stay on a little longer and port it to some other platforms or start working on a sequel. And even if it's intended to be a long-term MMO, if it's really terrible, maybe they'll switch directly to maintenance mode instead of working on expansion. In general, it's almost always the case that the game team will be largest immediately before the launch and will downsize after launch. How much and how fast will depend on the type of game it is and how well it does. Here's a nice slide that I found from an old Capcom presentation. It shows an ideal workflow as the game goes through the production cycle. The development moves forward in stages with lots of meetings, quality control, iterates and tests and gives feedback, and with many improvements and modifications and iterations, the production moves forward to the game release. This would be great. In reality, this is what it usually looks like. And from personal experience, I can say it might look something like this if you could see the details. I've seen pretty much all of these and many more, so these are just examples, but yeah, part of a producer's job is trying to make the arrow look more like the first straight arrow and less like this, but it is not always possible, unfortunately, and there will always be a few wiggles along the way. So, what kind of jobs are there in games? Well, what you would do on a typical day is going to depend a lot on what your official job is, as well as what the current development stage of the game is. What you do in pre-production is very different from what you do in production and maybe different from what you do when the game is live. There are a lot of different jobs that you can do working on games. The core of a game is its design. Without the design, you don't really have a game. If you think about a card game, if you think about the game of poker, for example, and you think about the game of bridge, well, they both are played with the same deck of cards. They both have the same art and the same hmm, engineering back end. But what makes them different is the design. Design defines the game. Design defines the goals, the rules, how you win. If a game isn't fun, no amount of pretty art and clever programming is going to make it a great game. On the other hand, games like Minecraft show that you don't necessarily need fancy art or other things to make a great game. There can be many types of designers. They include things like writers, who create the story and the lore for the world, level designers, who often work closely with the art team to define the layout of levels and areas, Systems designers who balance the economy and define the stats and equipment and the effects of spells and abilities. Content designers who create quests and the gameplay experience within a level. There are also cinematics designers who do cutscenes and things like that. Audio designers, UI designers, and much more. The larger the game team is, the more specialized the roles may become. Along with design, the art and engineering teams form the core of a game. In a tiny independent game, this could all be one person doing it all and probably more himself. In a large company, it's probably separate departments and many specialized roles inside it. As a game gets bigger, it's too much for one person to handle and specialists make sense. Artists can specialize in, for example, terrain, in creatures, in animation, special effects, and more. Engineers can also specialize such as game systems, artificial intelligence for the creatures in the game, uh, or they may make tools for designers and artists to use, or they may concentrate on server stability and efficiency, and so on. Once there is enough of the game to be actually playable, quality assurance is extremely important. It is essential to test the work of design, art, and engineering. And although it may sound like fun to have a job where you spend all day playing the game, it's really a lot of attention to detail, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of playing the same thing over and over, trying to find subtly different ways to break it. It requires a lot of checklists, and a lot of attention to detail. QA tends to be an entry-level position, but there can be long-term careers in QA. And the QA department is absolutely essential to finding all those bugs and ensuring the quality of your game is satisfactory before it's released. In an ideal world, the QA department should be the guys with the power to say, yes, this game is ready to release, or no, it's not. Unfortunately, due to other factors, this isn't always the case, but when it's not, the game almost always suffers. Closer to launch and after the game launches, customer service, community, and marketing teams take on an increasing role. These can overlap a bit. Customer service assists players directly and tends to catch any bugs that QA didn't find, for example. The community team are also among the first to hear about bugs. Community are responsible for interfacing with the players and encouraging the growth of a strong player community. They are typically the folks who are posting on the game's forums, on Twitter, on Facebook. 
they keep the player base updated on the state of the game, upcoming downtimes, upcoming events. They represent the game to the players, but they also represent the players to the developers. They advocate for player concerns and they're the voice of the players to the developers. The brand marketing and PR teams can overlap slightly with community at times in that they also represent the game to the outside world. Brand and PR, however, work on a higher level than the community team, which deals directly with players. The brand marketing and PR teams represent the game to media outlets, to advertisers, product placement, that kind of thing. Depending on the company, there may also be other departments involved with making a game such as human resources, such as finance, such as legal. Even if you don't want to work in game development directly, but if you love games, you may find it's a great opportunity to work in a gaming company. It can be hard to find, for example, marketing or legal staff who love games, so that could give you an advantage in a job interview. So now you know a little bit about the types of jobs that you might have in making a game. The next question is, what's it like? Is it a nice industry to work in? Like any industry, it's got its good points, its bad points, and its neutral points that are just a fact of the life in the industry. While I'm sure I can't cover everything, I tried to think of a few points that struck me about the game industry that are different from what I was used to working in IT support. One thing you'll notice is that gamers on the whole do not tend to be morning people. There are a lot of night owls, so the workday often starts closer to 10 a.m. However, that also means that you'll work later in the evenings and might not leave till 6, 7, or even later. Depending on your job role, this can be fairly flexible. Many companies have a set of core hours where you're expected to be present so that meetings can be scheduled, but outside that, as long as you put in your full workday, they're pretty flexible about whether you come in early or late. This will obviously depend on what company you end up working for, however. Next point. You will almost certainly work in a cubicle, probably a dark one. I'm fairly sure that a certain percentage of programmers are required to be vampires by contract, and artists tend to get very grumpy about reflections from fluorescent lighting overhead, so if you really like natural daylight, you might want to just check during your interview if you can take a look at the area that you'll be sitting in, and maybe invest in some daylight spectrum light bulbs. Dress code is very casual. The typical uniform for game developer is what I'm wearing today, jeans and a kind of geeky t-shirt. While this comic is a little bit of an exaggeration, I've worked with people who were wearing their pajamas, I've worked with people dressed as superheroes, one of my good friends frequently dresses as a dwarf. It's obviously going to depend on the company you work for, but chances are good you're not going to be in a three-piece suit. Excel is going to be your new best friend. This may be a little less true for artists and programmers, but if you're in any type of game design, chances are you are going to use Excel every day. If you're a systems designer, you will probably never close it. So I'd highly recommend that if you're looking at getting into game design, take the opportunity now to learn as much as you can about Excel, tricks, and formulas. I've yet to meet anyone in the industry who has not at some point wished they'd learned more about Excel. So those have all been fairly neutral points. Let's look at some of the downsides to the industry. First of all, you'll notice that game design is kind of a cool job. A lot of people want to get into it. That means there's a lot of competition for jobs and that does tend to keep salaries lower than in other industries where there are fewer applicants. The more qualifications your job requires, the less likely that is to be true, for example, artists and programmers tend to earn higher salaries than game designers. But keep your eyes open and do your research. You can find salary surveys online, they happen almost every year, and that will give you a ballpark figure, although of course depending on your exact job role and the company and the region you're working in, this will vary for you. If earning a high salary really is more important to you than working in games, then you might want to think twice, but do do your research and make up your own mind. A second downside that you've probably heard of is overtime. There will be overtime. And unless you're an hourly contractor, which you probably will not be, it will not pay extra. Some companies are better for this than others, and a post-release game and an established company will likely have less overtime than a pre-release game and an inexperienced company, but this is an ongoing fact and often problem in the game industry. When you're considering companies to apply to, do your research and ask around. Some overtime is pretty much guaranteed, and that's true of any professional job, not just the game development industry. But you should watch out for horror stories and just be aware that it has been an issue and there are a few companies where it still is. The third thing I'll warn you about is just to know that once you become a game developer, you will never again be able to relax and enjoy playing games the way you used to. Once games become your work, playing games will always have an element of working. You will always be critiquing the game you're playing and analyzing the details. 
whether you're a UI artist or a special effects guru or a designer or a programmer or an audio engineer, you will look at every other game you ever play again and think about work. You will be unable to play any game you actually worked on without typing up a list of bugs and things to check on once you're back in the office. This will make you a better game industry professional, and you will still enjoy games, but it's never going to be the carefree relaxation that it once was. Now, hopefully I haven't scared you away entirely, because now let's talk about some of the upsides. And there are some real upsides to balance out the downsides. The one that's most important to me is that passionate players means instant feedback. In most jobs, in most industries, you do your job every day, day in and day out, and no one ever says thank you, and if you're lucky, your boss notices it all unless you really happen to love the job for its own sake, this is pretty depressing after a while. However, working on a live game, that's not a problem. As soon as you have players, you have feedback, a lot of feedback. When you do something they like, they will let you know about it. When you do something they don't like, oh yes, they will let you know about it. This can be both positive and negative, but it's very rewarding overall. There are very few other jobs where you'll get so much feedback so quickly, and it makes a huge difference, and it's one of the things I love most about working in games. Another big plus is that you get to work with awesome people who share many of the same interests as you. The game industry is full of people who love games and geeky things and who are very accepting of your strange hobbies. When I was an IT manager, I worked in a largely entertainment company, which was mostly sales and marketing people. They were very nice people, but we didn't share any interests at all. And if the highlight of my weekend had been finally killing that dragon in EverQuest, there was no way I could ever explain that to them on a Monday when they asked how my weekend was. Transitioning to the game industry was kind of like finding a huge extended family of geeks just like me. It makes the office a pleasant place to be. There's generally a lot of joking and a very relaxed atmosphere with occasional Nerf gun battles. That's not something you'll find working in a bank or in most other places, and I really value it. So, that's a bit about the game industry and the pros and cons of working in it. Let's say I haven't scared you off and you still think it might be your dream job. How do you actually break into the industry? How do you get qualified to make games? This is a quote that I really love. You may love to play games, but that doesn't necessarily make you a game developer. I love to eat dinner, but that doesn't make me a chef. Making games is hard work, and it's not at all the same as just liking to play them. To become a game developer, you need the right kind of attitude, skills, and experience. So how do you get that? And this is the paradox you'll find no matter what job you want to get in any industry. Companies want to hire people with experience. People without experience can't get experience if companies won't hire them. Fortunately, you're all gamers, and as gamers, we know how to find the exploits. You need to find a way to get experience before you start applying for jobs. That means you should start thinking about this now. Don't wait till you graduate, now. As soon as you know what type of jobs you're going to want to apply for, or even as soon as you think you have some ideas, start looking up the job ads. Pay attention to what experience they're asking for. Now you can spend the next few years getting that experience in any way you can, before you need it in that job interview. And there's no one single right way to do that, but there are a number of common ways that people often do use to get experience and break into the industry, so I'll go over a couple. First, since we already talked about it in my case, many game devs come from the player community because they love games. Being recognized for your passion for games is a great way to meet and develop relationships with game developers. There's many ways to do this, some may be more or less relevant to the particular type of game or company that you're interested in, but they might include working on fan sites, working with professional media, volunteering to help with a game, doing podcasts or webcasts, professional tournaments, create mods for the game, create plugins and tools for the game, do custom textures for the game, custom levels. Depending on the game, what's available, there should be something that you can do in pretty much any type of game. Doing that kind of thing will not only earn you experience with the game, it will also get you recognized by the game developers and potentially get you in contact with them. Another great way to break into the game industry is by being a game developer already. I know that sounds like a paradox, but it's not really. There's a lot that you can do to get game development experience without requiring a whole team. You could make a board game or a card game. You could make a level mod for an existing game. You could make a new game using an existing game's design tools. If you have the skills, you could make a Facebook game, a mobile game, a Flash game, a text-based game. In this class, you've been learning some of the tools that you can use, and many of them will allow you to make something yourself. Most important of all is that you actually finish some projects that you can actually show people when you interview. Anybody can have a dozen great ideas for games, but very few people actually have the attention span, the motivation, and the attention to detail to turn that idea into a finished project. It's that one person in a hundred who actually produces things that is top of my list to hire. You need to show that you can plan and complete a project. Having a finished project is better than having a perfect project, because no project is ever perfect. 
Another way to break into the industry that you'll often hear mentioned is entry level. Get into a gaming company through an entry level position and then hope to work your way onto a design team. Entry level usually means customer service or quality assurance, but there may be other options too. It will be low pay, hourly contract work most likely, and it will probably have few or no benefits. There's also no guarantee you'll advance, and the chances of this can vary a lot depending on the company, so please do your research and find out that company's policy and frequency of promotion from within. I know quite a lot of people who got into game design through a QA or customer service background. Fewer artists and programmers, but I do know a couple. However, I also know people who've been working in QA longer than I've been in the industry and who are still hoping to break into game design. This is not a guaranteed path. In recent years, there are more and more colleges and similar offering educational qualifications in game design. For programmers and artists, professional certifications can certainly be useful. For game designers, however, although there are lots of colleges offering game design courses, there's no standard professional certification and your degree doesn't really mean anything to the people interviewing you. It's not like being a plumber or being a doctor where once you get qualified, you're pretty much guaranteed that anybody who's looking for a plumber or a doctor will accept that you could do the job. Game design is not like that. I do not know anybody in the industry who has ever hired somebody on the basis simply of what game design educational qualification they have. In fact, I only know one game designer I've worked with in all of these years who's even got a degree in game design, and that was completely irrelevant to the reason she was hired. You do not need a course in game design to get into this industry. It probably won't even help in your interview. The two things it will do for you are, number one, force you to complete projects that you can then show to your interviewers, and number two, it may open up some networking opportunities and help introduce you to people who work in the industry. You can achieve both of these in other ways, however. If you want to go to a college or university, consider some other more recognized degree that is still applicable to game design. Psychology or economics, for example, would be very applicable. And you'll also have wider options if game development doesn't turn out to work for you. I don't want to discourage you entirely, but if you do decide to pursue a specialist game design degree, do your research. There are some good ones out there which will give you a good background, but there's a lot of very dubious for-profit schools out there who will be happy to take your money and do absolutely nothing to help you get into the industry. You will pay a lot of money for a degree, so make sure it's worth it. Do your research. What all of the previous methods have in common is networking. Networking on its own is probably not going to get you a job, but it's hugely helpful and can give you a big advantage in getting to the interview stage. And by networking, I don't mean sucking up to people you want to work for. I mean meeting people who work in the industry you want to do, doing the job that you want to do, getting to know them and learning from them. And these are the people who will be the first to hear if a job opens up and can let you know first. They may be your coworkers or bosses one day if things go well. You want them to feel they'd be happy to work with you, to recommend that you're worth an interview and give you a chance. You want them to think of you as pleasant and competent, not annoying or unprofessional or a sycophant. So on to the scary stuff. How do you actually apply for a job and what do you do at the interview? First of all, start preparing yourself and start now, even if you don't expect to graduate for a few years. Read the industry news regularly. Stay aware of changes in the game industry that could affect your job search when you're ready to. Research the companies that you think you might be interested in. Join forums, join social networks, etc., where the people you want to work with hang out. If you can get to know someone doing the job you want, they'll be a great source of advice. Start reading the job ads. As I mentioned already, start now. Start long before you're ready to actually apply for jobs. Figure out what the job you want requires and load up on all the qualifications you can between now and when you plan to apply for it. Use the next few years to stack the odds in your favor. When you're ready to apply for a job, Keep in mind that even if you don't meet all the qualifications for a job ad, but you think you can do it, apply anyway. What's the worst thing that can happen? You won't get the job? Well, you're not going to get it if you don't apply for it. Any job opening in the industry tends to get a lot of applicants, and naming specific qualifications can sometimes be a way of narrowing down the number of applications they have to read through. If you really are an outstanding candidate, they may still consider you. It's worth a try. Customize your cover letter for every company you're applying to and your resume and proofread it. Really proofread it. Have a friend. Double check. Clean up your social media. In fact, do this now. I can tell you one of the first things that I usually do when someone is applying for a company that I work at is I'll look for what they've said in public in the past. I'll look at their Twitter feed. I'll look for any articles about them. If I see them saying unprofessional things that I would not want them saying about my company, why would I want to hire them? 
read the instructions for the application and follow them. If you can't even follow the instructions on how to apply correctly, what would lead me to think that you can do the job? And finally, never give up. Never say, oh, that's my dream job, but there's no point in applying because. I can't tell you how many people I've seen reply to a post about a job opening saying, oh, I would love to do this job, but if this is really your dream job and your passion, don't let anything stand in your way. I moved from Australia to live in a crazy country where I'm not even a citizen. I have never regretted a moment of that. Don't give up on your dreams before you even try. So let's say you get to an interview. Great, congratulations. Chances are your first interview is going to be by phone. Make sure you've got a quiet, uninterrupted environment, obviously, and take notes. Pay attention to what they're asking you for. Most likely, the first people that you talk to by phone are narrowing down the list of possible candidates before they fly them in, which is more expensive, to talk to people whose time is more valuable. So the questions that you're asked in the initial stage are probably an indication of what information they want to know you know. Do your research on these areas and be prepared to elaborate a bit more in the second interview if you get it. Some companies may also require written tests, depending on the position. And I should add, don't be tempted to submit quantity over quality. Be concise, be to the point, and remember that the person you're sending it to may have dozens or even more applications to read, and they're unlikely to look kindly upon unnecessary wordiness. And a couple of tips. Avoid typos, sloppy formatting, or bad grammar in your resume and cover letter, especially if you're boasting about your attention to detail. If I've got a stack this high of applicants that I'm going through and I find a guy who's boasting about his attention to detail and he's got typos and bad formatting and bad grammar, straighten the bin. Research the company before an interview. Know who the execs are. Look up your interviewers. Find out as much as you can about the game and the company. This should be a duh moment, but you would be amazed. Play the game if possible or the company's other games. Play similar games in the genre. You shouldn't be sitting in an interview and have absolutely no idea what the game is even like. And again, you'd think this would just be common sense, but the last, second to last interview that I conducted, the guy hadn't even played our game, had no idea, hadn't played any game in the same genre. Why are you wasting my time? Bring a list of questions about the position. Be prepared to answer why you would be a great fit for this game rather than somebody else. They may not ask you that question, but you should still know. If you don't know why they should hire you, you're not going to convince anybody else. And that brings us to the end. I hope I've given you some idea what it's like to work in the game industry and maybe some ideas on whether or not this might be your dream job. Whether or not it is, I hope you've learned a few useful ideas about how to approach getting your dream job. If I could give you one thing to take away from this talk, it is to go home tonight, look up some job descriptions for the job that you think you want to do, and start figuring out how to get there from where you are now. Think like a gamer. Find the exploits. Find the way to get the experience that you're going to need in a few years when you're really applying for those jobs. I wish you the best of luck, and thank you very much for having me today.